Good morning, church. Hello, and good morning to all of you who are with us online. It is great to be with you here at Elwood First. It is Palm Sunday, and we've got folks lining up in the back with their palm fronds. And after the announcements are over, during the prelude, for anybody who wants to go in the back and receive a palm frond and process with us during our opening hymn, we invite you to do that. I want to give you a few um, announcements today. For uh, online worshipers, make sure that you check in. Let us know that you're there. We would love to be able to say hello to you as you're with us this morning. You have invitations in the back for Holy Week that is coming up on Thursday. Let's see. I better look at this so I don't miss any details. On Thursday, we're having a soup supper at 6 p.m. in Fellowship Hall and then a worship service at 7 here in the sanctuary. On Good Friday, we have a service here in the sanctuary at 7 p.m. The Easter Vigil on Saturday, there's not an order of service. It is come and go. I'll be in here between 7 and 8 Saturday evening just for a time of prayer. If anybody wants to be here for that, you're welcome to just come in anytime between 7 and 8. And in Easter, we have our sunrise service in the parlor at 7.30, breakfast in Fellowship Hall at 8.30, and then the Easter service at 9.30, followed by the Easter egg hunt after that for our worshipers. You have all that information in your bulletin, and there are handouts available in the back that you can give to those who you would like to invite to come to any of our Holy Week events in these coming days. Easter lily orders are due today. Many of you got a message about that. These forms are in the back, and I don't know if we want to put those. Do you want those, Debbie, or do you want them in the offering plates? Give them to Bev. Either way, make sure that these get to Jill's desk in the office if you don't put them in Debbie or Bev's hand uh, this morning. So those are available in the back near where Lester is right now as well. Uh, for our parents of students who are in college or going to college, I don't know all of the eligibility requirements yet, but our endowment scholarships are coming up. So I'll reach out to some of those families uh, just to let you know that that money is available for your student to apply for and see if they can get a grant or an endowment scholarship. We would love for you to be aware of that. Uh, upper rooms, we still have not received those. We did get in touch with upper room and they are having delivery issues. So I know it's a bad time during Lent season to not have those. We apologize. Uh, they are working on the problem that they are having. I'm going to ask Diana to come up and share an announcement with us of a new ministry, a little uh, mission and outreach that is available to you. tub will be in the parlor so that you can grab a bag and in that bag you can place crackers, tea bags, lotion, anything you want and a card, a scripture from the Bible promoting hope and peace in the world. So if you know someone who is feeling down and out, they're struggling, things are not going well for them, and you would like to just give them a little cheerful heads up, take this, put them in here, take the bag with you, and give it to your neighbor, your friend, anyone across town, anyone you would like to recognize and help cheer them up a little bit. So this is our Bags of Hope. Thank you. And it's a really good time because she has a few Easter bags left in there. I have filled up a few. You can tuck your invitation in that bag with a few treats and scripture, and that's a nice opportunity to gift that to someone this week as you're inviting them to our church. We're going to begin our worship now with our prelude, and I invite you again to gather in the back for our processional of
I'm sorry. You just help me. What is this for? Why do we do this? You know? No? No? Well, we're celebrating something. Palm Sunday, right? And the reason we celebrate Palm Sunday is because years and years and years and years ago, Jesus was celebrating Passover, okay? And Passover is like this huge holiday. It's like Christmas and Easter and Fourth of July all wrapped up together, and they have a big party. And Jesus was coming into town, and people knew Jesus, okay? They knew who he was. He was kind of like a rock star, like Andrew Luck or Taylor Swift or somebody like that. And he was coming into town, and they were happy. So they have this big party, and they laid these down so he could come in. Now, do you know how he came into town? No? He came into town on a donkey. Now, you know how big a donkey is? A donkey's not very big, is it? And I wanted Andy to stand up. Now, look at this. Can you imagine Andy riding in on a donkey? <laughs> he's going to look a little silly, isn't he? His legs are going to be hanging over, and he's going to ride in. He's not going to look really like a rock star. He could have rode in a horse or a camel. Horses would have been great because the people really wanted Jesus to well, be a warrior. Camels are so big you can't even ride them. Well, some people ride camels though. They have like little saddles and you can ride a camel. And they did back then. How could you get on a camel? Well, they have to sit down. They have to get down on the ground and you get on the camel and then they stand up. It's not fun. It is. It's really hard. And you feel like you're going to fall over. But they do it. But that's not but what Jesus wrote, is it? I feel like you're going to fall over like somebody's knocking you over. You're right. It exactly felt like that. But Jesus rode in on a donkey because he was trying to tell something. He was trying to tell them that he wasn't going to be this warrior. They wanted him to come in with a sword and kill all the Romans so they could have another July 4th. But that's not what he did. He came in and left everybody. And he came in on a donkey because he was trying to tell them God had a plan. Isn't that a little silly donkey? Can you see somebody riding that? No. No, but God had a plan for us. And God has a plan for each of us. And it's important for us to listen to God's plan. And Jesus was trying to tell him when he rode in on that donkey, this is God's plan, not what you have planned. I'm not a warrior. I'm going to love your soul. I'm not going to save it by killing people. I'm going to save it by loving you. Okay, so I'm going to give you these donkeys, thank you, sir, um, so that you remember to look for God's plan, because God has a plan for each of us, and God's plan is awesome, okay? All right, pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the plans you have in our life, and thank you for giving us, Jesus, to show us that you have a plan that will be absolutely perfect for us. We just have to keep our eyes open and we have to watch because you'll give us signals. You'll tell us what that plan is. But we have to open our hearts and our minds and our, heart, our souls to listen to your plan and not get clouded by ours. In your son's name we pray. Amen. All right. I'm going to take one back for you guys. Okay. I'm going to give one to Andy for his help today. <laughs> well, they just started us off with prayer, and I want to invite us to continue in an attitude of prayer. So are there any uh, things you want to lift up today, any joys you want to celebrate, or any prayers for concern that you would like to share with your brothers and sisters here this morning? All right. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we thank you today for this spirit of celebration, for all the ways that you guide us to see what there is to rejoice in, the blessings that are abundant in our lives if we only open our eyes and look, the joy that you pour out, the peace that envelops us, and the love of Christ that fills our hearts. Help us, God, to see that these blessings are enough to help us to get through this day and that new every morning, you bless us yet again for another day that you have given to us. We pray, Lord, that as we receive these blessings, that we feel your sustenance, that we feel the provision that we need to endure whatever it is that will come in this world. You know, God, that these things weigh us down, that we are, we are not donkeys that can carry heavy loads often enough. 
but instead we feel crushed under the weight of the world some days. So be with us, Lord, those of us who are here today who feel weighed down by our own burdens in our minds, in our hearts, in our bodies, or in our spirits. Renew us once more, God. Lighten what it is we are carrying, what it is that concerns us or that tries to steal that joy so that we may walk firmly and faithfully in you. Be with us, God, as we reach out in our prayers to all the people and all the places that concern us. For soldiers we love who are stationed in dangerous places, for family and friends in situations that are not full of your loving relationship, for the families that we can name in part, but mostly we, we cannot name, who are in Palestine and Israel. For the warring nations around the world, God, we know that your will is for peace. And so we pray for you to interrupt all the conflict that the world creates as you recreate us once more anew. Be with us, God, as we find ourselves in need of Jesus. Help us to see him walking with us every step of the way. These are our prayers that we, as we join our voices together now in the prayer that he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our reading this morning is from Psalm 22, verses 1 through 18. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? O oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried, and were saved. In you they trusted, and were not put to shame. But I am a worm, and not human, scorned by others, and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me. They make mouths at me. They shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver. Let him rescue the one in whom he delights. Yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe on my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth, and since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls encircle me. Strong bowls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs are all around me, a company of evildoers encircles me. My hands and feet have shriveled. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. During our series of Finding Jesus in the Psalms, we've looked at Psalm 23, and that's the psalm that we always really enjoy hearing when we're at funerals. A word of hope, a word of comfort lifts us up. But there's something that comes before we need a word of comfort. The reasons why we need to be comforted. And Psalm 22 is one of those passages. This is the first half of maybe the most well-known messianic poem that there is. When I first discovered Psalm 22, and if you've never read it, I encourage you to read through that. I'll read the rest of it in a little bit. But when I first discovered it as a baby pastor and was discovering that I had to read it out loud, I couldn't get through it without choking up, without getting all emotional, because it just hit me in these tender places, thinking about the heaviness of life and suffering that we know, that we ourselves have endured. It really captured a sense of, for me, of my unworthiness before a divine and perfect God, as I knew the experiences of those things. Have, has anybody here heard of the devotional Jesus Calling by Sarah Young? Any Jesus Calling? Got a few hands that are up. So this devotional Jesus Calling has this amazing gift of making it seem like Jesus is speaking just to you in your situation, and the next person whose situation is different. It is just written in such a way that you feel like Jesus is speaking into your life, whatever you're going through. Psalm 22 is the psalm that captures this as well. It hits us right where we are. And in the season of Lent that we're in now, approaching Easter, so close, but not there yet, it also points us to the suffering of Jesus, what he would endure in his final days, and God's purpose for, for those final days, for me, for you, for the whole world. It's a really powerful psalm. And how, and how David, who wrote it, expressed his raw emotions, his own times of hopelessness, and still in it, the faith of God for him and for the whole world, promising eternal love and rescue. It's an astounding lament and praise together from the perspective of a king. And we're going to hear more about the praise part of that. That's not what you heard in Andy's reading so far, but we'll get to the praise part in a little bit. Before we go too far into this Psalm 22, we're going to consider some of Jesus' experiences as a king himself, leading to the moment when he quoted this psalm, and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We're going to consider his journey to that place on the cross that begins here with his followers, including us today, waving palm branches. Let us pray. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, God. May we hear your word 
and be inspired by it, and may our lives be changed in the hearing. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. So we have talked for weeks about David being a king, or, or what his life was like a little bit, and his honesty as he wrote the Psalms, how he experienced life, but also how his life pointed to the life of Jesus. We have yet to look at how Jesus' life reflected the life of a king, considering his own signs that pointed to his kingship. So as we march on towards Easter this week, we're going to get these touches as well. If you come to our other services, we're going to spend more time in those moments but today, being Palm Sunday, we celebrate. We get to catch our breath during Lent season for just a little bit. We celebrate what has come to be known as the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. From here through next weekend, past the celebration, we're going to walk with Jesus through his passion, his suffering, his death, his resurrection. But right now, I'm going to invite you to celebrate. Would you stand for the reading of the gospel we're going to be reading from the Gospel of Mark 11, verses 1 through 11. It's a ritual that Christians have done for many years. You always wonder, why are we sitting now, or why are we standing? When we hear the Gospel message, that's from Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, that is a traditional ritual where Christians stand for that word, the good news of Jesus. When they're approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been written. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple, and when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. You may be seated. So this simple act, how Jesus entered Jerusalem, really nothing to it, it's actually a really huge deal because finally, finally, at long last, Jesus is making an announcement beyond his closest followers about his identity. He is declaring to all of Israel that he is the prophesied king. He is the Messiah for them. It's a big deal also because the people have not had one single king, a uniting king, for a really long time, not since King Solomon, David's son, when his reign ended around 931 BCE. The kingdom split in two after Solomon. You had the kingdom in the north, that is Israel, the kingdom of Israel, it includes Samaria and Galilee. You had the kingdom in south, the kingdom of Judah, and that's where Jerusalem is but they had not had the king of Israel as a whole for a very long time. And both kingdoms had been destroyed by the 6th century BCE, so for over 600 years, Israel itself had no king that they could claim as their own. They had been under the rule of the Assyrians, the Persians, the Babylonians, now the Romans, for a very long time. But finally, finally today, Palm Sunday that we call it, David's promise of a kingdom that would never end seemed to be at hand. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. The people cried out in victory. They were so excited. They felt this longing and hope fulfilled. Hosanna, save us now. That prayer is finally going to be answered. We actually celebrate this day every month. You may not even realize it, but we celebrate the arrival of the Messiah every first Sunday or every time we have communion together. Next, the next first Sunday, listen for these words when we reenact the triumph of our king's arrival by declaring, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We could wave palm fronds every first Sunday if we wanted to do that because we are continuing to celebrate, save us, O king, as Jesus arrives. So as this king enters Jerusalem, garments, we don't have any garments up here, but makeshift garlands, 
were laid out on the road from whatever greenery people could find and, and cut off nearby, laid out like a red carpet, an act fitting for a king's procession. And that's what Jesus rode in on, this path of honor, on this little donkey. And the donkey that Manet told us about, we do not give it enough respect, this donkey, right? It just seems like such a humble creature. But the donkey itself is a kingly sign for the people. It signifies nobility. I think the donkeys we see today, I think they've lost that sense, right? But it signifies nobility and royalty. Both David and Solomon rode in on a donkey in their own kingship, making a sure sign of Jesus' connection to this royal family, to the reestablishment of the kingdom. The biblical donkey, if you see any time a donkey appears in the Bible, it also spoke to what kind of king Jesus was going to be. He was going to be a king of peace and humility. He was going to be a king of wisdom, but also of service and suffering. All that was captured in the symbolism of the donkey. Jesus not parading in on that proud steed, like Manet mentioned. The people, many Jews were wanting a military leader. They were wanting an insurrection. And so they're expecting this Messiah to come in on a horse as if he was ready to wage war against Rome. But that's not what happened. That's not what he did. But in addition to all the symbolism of the donkey itself, this act fulfilled a prophecy from Zechariah. Zechariah had declared that the people's king would come riding on a donkey. And it was a borrowed one. I went over to the farm and I borrowed a donkey, but I had to have your permission because that's, a value, that's valuable property, right? You're not just going to let some random stranger come in and borrow an animal from the farm. But for God's purpose, you're going to do that. This unnamed owner of the donkey senses something greater happening. He's not just loaning it out to a stranger. He is serving God's purpose to say that the king has come. So this is a very exciting time for the people. It's more than just what we do, this tradition of waving palm branches. This is life-changing. This changes their whole culture. This is going to change history for the people because their king is here. But it's also exciting for not good reasons. Because less than a week later, Jesus finds himself talking to Pilate, the Roman governor. He's accused of crimes worthy of execution, according to many who feel threatened by his presence and his power. But he affirms Pilate's question about being a king by saying, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. The voices of the people have cried out, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. There aren't as many voices crying out now. Crying out, save us now, king of the Jews, seeking for their grief of being without a king to end after centuries of mourning. Those who believe that the son of David is here at long last begin to dwindle at this point. And in a beat that happened so fast, their newfound king had on a purple cloak and a crown. But it wasn't a shiny crown with gems and gold. It was a crown of thorns on his head, the regalia for Jesus, as the soldiers who abused him now shouted, Hail, King of the Jews! as they scorned him. The throne for this king was a wooden cross. He did not have rings placed on his finger, but nails put in his hands. And it wasn't just the shouts of the people declaring Jesus as king, whether in earnest or mocking during his arrest. An inscription was written to make it official. Ho basileas ton hudeon, the king of the Jews. Hosanna, save us now. And Jesus did that very thing. He answered that prayer that was lifted up on that first Palm Sunday. And he would establish his kingdom forever in the highest heavens. So waving our palms, for the people who waved their palms for the first time, those branches, they didn't expect a week later for Jesus to cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But Hosanna isn't just the Christian victory shout of praise. For the Jews, it is an appeal for divine help. This is Jesus' Hosanna. 
as he's crying out. This is Jesus, Hosanna. He's crying out to God in his final days as he faced a terrible human death. Praying in the garden of Gethsemane, Hosanna, save me, deliver me, take this cup from me. Experiencing the fullness of humanity's suffering on the cross, Hosanna, I feel forsaken, save me. King David's despair poured out in the words of Psalm 22 that became divine through the lips of Jesus on the cross. Those words that captured the anguish of all humanity with them. Jesus is our voice in his Hosanna, crying out over all the things that we bear, crying out for the burdens of ours that are hung on the cross. And today we still ask the why question, this question we place to God, why? Why have you forsaken me, my God? Questions like, why have I been diagnosed with cancer? Why did my spouse have dementia? Why did my child die? Why? There is an endless list of the why questions that y'all can fill in. And the answers are unsatisfactory, or there just simply are no answers. And suffering is real, and it is with us. And Jesus, our Messiah, our King, the Christ, understands our suffering because he sits Shiva with us in it. He has experienced it. Jesus understands and warns with us when we feel abandoned by God in the unanswered question, why? When we're at someone's deathbed, Jesus is in this space with us. When we face financial or medical adversities, Jesus is in this space with us. When we feel attacked on all sides, Jesus is in this space with us. We are blessed by the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna. In the places of hopelessness and despair, we find Jesus as our Savior. We know deliverance may not come on this side of the mortal coil. Suffering may be our constant companion. But with his death and resurrection, his promise to save us eternally is delivered through the coming kingdom of our ancestor David, God's heavenly kingdom. God remains holy and trustworthy in this work of salvation for us. And Jesus replaces David and us by himself being scorned and despised and mocked by others to our benefit, taunted even as he hung dying on the cross. He fulfills what David spoke of in Psalm 22. His life poured out, his hands and feet pierced, bones out of joint, while evildoers surround him to gloat and take his clothing. The words of David in the rest of Psalm 22 hold fast in faith in spite of all the horror that he had described. But you, O Lord, do not be far away. O my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. From the horns of the wild oxen, you have rescued me. I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For the dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. Hosanna in the highest heaven. In the middle of whatever he was going through, David still praised God. When Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey, the people stopped what they were doing and praised God. The Psalms and the Gospels are telling us to do the same thing, 
to put our focus and our energy and our attention and our words and our actions, all that we are and all that we have, into praising God. Hosanna, save us. Save us. It's both a cry for help and a praise together. Words that are summed up in Psalm 22. When the going gets tough, the tough get going, crying out to God, because we know he saves us. We continue the Hosanna call because God is still at work through our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. On the cross, Jesus will say, it is finished. Deliverance is happening, but it's not finished for us yet in this world. And I'm going to invite you now with a cry of Hosanna in your heart. Hosanna, save us now. To lay before God this psalm that declares why we still need the Hosanna and how we trust God to deliver it. We're going to move into the Psalter. I'm going to invite you to turn to Psalter 752. The words will also be projected on the screen. It's a long one, so we're going to take extra time. <laughs> if you see, it's on 752 and 753 if you wanted to look in your hymnal. We'll sing it through several times. And I invite you to do the responses with me. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Yet you, the praise of Israel, are enthroned in holiness. In you, our forebears trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you, they cried and were saved. In you, they trusted and we're not disappointed. But I am a worm and not human, scorned by others and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me. They make mouths at me, they wag their heads. He committed his cause for the Lord. Let the Lord deliver him. Let the Lord rescue him, for the Lord delights in him. Yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe upon my mother's breast. Upon you I was cast from my birth. And since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws. You lay me down in the dust of death. Indeed, dogs surround me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my raiment, they cast lots. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who worship the Lord. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before the Lord. For dominion belongs to the Lord who rules over the nations. All who sleep in the earth shall bow down to the Lord. 
All who go down to the dust shall bow before the Lord, and I shall live before God. Posterity shall serve the Lord. Each generation shall tell of the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn. Surely the Lord has done it. So in your own life, when you're in the Psalm 22, the beginning of it, those words you heard, when you feel the world is crushing down on you, when you feel people mocking at you, when the burdens of life and all that it throws at you are just simply too much, I invite you to sing the Hosanna song as you're crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Let Jesus be your Hosanna and know that even through it, you are saved. And wave your palm branch and your spirits everywhere you go. I'm going to. A few things for you to be aware of. Again, some reminders. Go to, well, I don't know if they're in there yet, but go to the parlor before Sunday school class starts at 1045. Stay for Sunday school class. Uh, but you can go in that tub and you can make your own little bag, your bag of hope with some treats in there and a scripture passage. You can add the invitation for our events coming up this Holy Week and then share that with somebody that may not have a church home um, who is in need of an invitation because it's the personal invitation that people need to hear from us as an offering to be in relationship with Jesus Christ. It's your final chance to order Easter lilies if you want to get some in honor or in memory of a loved one. Those forms are in the back as well. Get those turned into the office before you leave today. But the best thing that you take out of here is this experience that you have had, this time with God and God going with you in it. Be encouraged by your brothers and sisters, whatever it is you're walking out into, let them be a part of that and sit with you in that space. But know that Jesus is there as well, always with you as God, the Father who created you, Jesus, the Son who saves you, and the Holy Spirit who will equip you with what you need to get through that. Go in peace.